welcome to part four, section 3.3, where we look at Descartes' rule of signs. This is a little bit of a history lesson if anyone's interested, and a history lesson from Mrs. Dalmage means I looked at Wikipedia. Anyway, so this is Rene Descartes. He was French. He was like born a while ago. I don't know his exact date of birth, but it was in the good old days where he could be like a philosopher and a mathematician. He also was a scientist. The cool thing about him is we've talked about him before. He, I don't really love the word created, but he's responsible for, he slapped his name on the Cartesian coordinate plane, named after Descartes. And it's just the coordinate plane that we all know and love, you know, that good old X, Y axis there um, and with the four quadrants. There are other coordinate planes uh, that you will eventually use in like trig or calc or higher levels of math. But the main one, that's our boy Descartes. He also, this is kind of interesting, he believed that all humans were born with innate knowledge from God rather than through experience, which would later be challenged by John Locke. So kind of some cool background info on our guy Descartes. Today we're going to take a look at his rule of signs for determining the number of positive and negative zeros, real zeros, in a polynomial. Here is Descartes' rule of signs written out in all its glory. Again, looks more overwhelming than it really is, and going through some examples will definitely help us. So f of x needs to be written out. We call it general form. Basically just needs to be not factored at all, no parentheses, and we need to make sure that all the terms are written in order. So the exponents are descending, going down. We are going to count the number of sign changes in f of x, meaning going from a positive term to a negative term or vice versa. That's a sign change. Then that tells us about the number of positive real zeros. It's either how many si sign changes we have or going down by two, uh, a multiple of two. Then we need to find f of negative x. We count the number of sign changes there. That tells us the number of negative real zeros or going down by a multiple of two. Let's take a look at some examples. In this first example, we want to list the possible amount or number of positive and negative real roots for this quartic polynomial. This is a polynomial we've dealt with already. So in order to determine how many positive real zeros or real roots we have, we need to find P. Um, on the previous slide, when we saw what Descartes' rule of signs was, capital P is how many sign changes we have in f of x. So P is the number of sign changes in f of x, the original function. So I'm going to write out f of x again, not changing it at all. It's 2x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus x squared minus 6x minus 3. If we take a look from term to term, how many times do we change a sign? The first term is positive. The second term is positive. There was not a change in sign there. This term is positive and the next term is negative. That is a sign change. Then we go from a negative to a negative, then a negative to a negative. We only have one sign change from positive to negative. So P is one. Descartes' rule of sign says that the number of positive real zeros is either p or going down from p by a multiple of two. Well, I can't subtract two from one. I'll get a negative one and we can't have a negative number of, of something. So because you know we can't go down, like I can't do negative one, negative three, I can't keep going down by multiples of two, the number of positive real zeros is one. So there's one positive real root. Remember, roots and zeros are the same thing. Next, let's find how many negative real zeros we have. In order to find the number of negative real zeros, we need to find n. n is the number of sign changes in f of negative x. I do want to note that I'm writing no period. That stands for number of. All right, we need to find f of negative x which is a little more complex. That means plugging in negative x into every single x. So we will have two and then negative x to the fourth plus four and then negative x to the third 
minus negative x squared minus 6 times negative x minus 3. Now, when we are taking a negative number to an even power, it's the same as taking the, like the opposite of it, its positive version of that number to the even power, meaning it doesn't matter if we square 3 or square negative 3, we're still getting 9. Meaning, raising something to the fourth or to the second is not changing the original term. It doesn't matter that it was negative in here. So when we rewrite this, this first term, it didn't matter that it was f of negative x. It's still just the same thing as if it was 2x to the fourth. The negative didn't change the outcome of that term because we're taking it to an even power. So that first term didn't change. The next term, however, is going to change. Cubing a negative number will give a negative output, or the opposite output as if we put the positive version of the number in, meaning it changes this term to minus 4x cubed. The next term stays as a minus x squared. That term is not changing from its original minus x squared. It doesn't matter that we're squaring this negative. Squaring a negative still gives us the same output as the original function. It's not changing. This, however, is. This is an x to the first, an odd power. If you think about it, this minus 6 times this minus x changes it to a plus x. It's changing what the original term was. The minus 3 is untouched because there's no x with it. All right, now we need to count how many sign changes we have in our f of negative x function. The first term's positive and the second term is negative. That's our first sign change. This term's negative, and then this term's negative. There's no sign change. This term's negative to this positive term. That's a sign change. And positive 6x to minus 3, that's a sign change. So n is 3. Remember that n stands for the number of sign changes in f of negative x. Therefore, the number of negative real roots or real zeros could be either 3 or we could go down by a multiple of 2. We could keep going down by 2. So we could also have 1 negative real root. So we could have either 3 or 1 negative real roots or root. Um, so it really does depend. So let's think about how this relates to the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that whatever the degree of our original polynomial is, in this case it's four, um, that's how many roots we have total. So we're gonna have four total roots. Now roots can either be real or imaginary, and imaginary roots need to come in pairs. So let's say that all four of these roots are real. If that's the case, then we would have one positive real root, because Descartes' rule of science tells us that we do have to have that. And then the other three would end up being the negative real roots. Okay, that would be the possibility if all four of those roots were real. Let's say only two of those roots were real, meaning the other two would be imaginary, since again, imaginary roots come in pairs. That would mean that one of those real roots would be positive and one of them would be negative. There is no chance that none of them are real um, and that all four are imaginary because Descartes' rule of signs is telling us we have to have one positive real and either three or one negative real roots. How do we know what is the case, like which one of those two scenarios it is? Well, we can work through it algebraically or we can take a look at our graph, which we will do. All right, so here is this function graphed. I'm going to zoom in just a bit. Descartes' rule of signs said that we definitely had to have, whoops, one positive real root. And here it is at like 1.2-ish. And then we have to have either one or three negative reals. Now take a look over here. We can see that we actually hit the x-axis twice over here but we still have three negative real roots. Let's think about why. We have to think about their multiplicity. If we take a look at this negative root over here, it looks like it's right at negative one. It is hard to tell though, unless we keep zooming in. Um, this root hits the x-axis, our function rather, hits the x-axis and then bounces back. That means that this root here has a multiplicity of two. It occurs twice. 
And then this root over here goes right through the x-axis, meaning it has a multiplicity of 1. So this root has a multiplicity of 2. It occurs twice, so there's two of our negative real roots, and here's the third one. So we do actually have three negative real roots along with the one positive real root, and that means that in this quartic, aka degree 4 polynomial, all four of the roots ended up being real. And Descartes' rule of signs told us the possibilities for how many positive and how many negative. Graphing allowed us to confirm. In our second example, we want to again find the possible number of both positive and negative real zeros using Descartes' rule of signs. The first thing that we need to do is count the sign changes in f of x to find the possible number of positive real zeros. I rewrote out f of x, and now we need to count how many sign changes we have. Remember, a sign change means that going from term to term, from left to right, we either go from positive to negative or negative to positive, a literal sign change. Our first term is positive, and then we go to a negative term. That counts as one sign change. Then we go from a negative term, negative 3x to the fourth, to a positive. That's another sign change. Then we go from a positive term to a negative term then a negative term to a positive term. So we actually have four sign changes. So positive P, or positive P, capital P is four. And because capital P is four, that just means that we have four sign changes in F of X. Therefore, the number of positive real zeros is four or we can go down by multiples of two. So we could have two real positive real zeros, or we could have zero, because we can go keep going down by twos until it doesn't make sense anymore. All right, the next step is to find the number of negative real zeros. The way that we do this is we find f of negative x. I'm not gonna go through this as in depth. If you're struggling with finding f of negative x, I recommend looking back at example one. So f of negative x, is going to be negative 2x to the fifth, since that is an odd exponent, minus 3x to the fourth, that's an even exponent, the term doesn't change, minus 6x cubed, that is an odd exponent, so the term becomes opposite, minus 8x squared, that has an even exponent, the term doesn't change, and then plus 3 does not have an x, so it's not affected. All right, how many sign changes do we have? It looks like our first four terms are all negative, therefore we only have one sign change from negative to positive right there. So n, the number of sign changes in f of negative x is only one. That means that the number of negative real zeros is one, and it can only be one because we can't go down by two there since we can't have a negative amount of negative real zeros. All right, so we can sort of think about this from a fundamental theorem of algebra point of view in that this is a quintic polynomial, meaning it has five total roots, and all five of those roots could be real. If that's the case, four of them would be positive and one of them would be negative. All right, out of those five total roots, we could have three of them being real and two of them being imaginary, since imaginary roots come in pairs. If that's the case, two of those real roots are positive and one's negative. Or out of the five total roots, only one of them could be real and the other four could be imaginary. In that case, that real root would not be positive, it would in fact be negative. So we know that we have to have one negative real root. Let's take a look at Desmos and see what it is. Here is our function, our polynomial graphed. We will zoom in just a bit to see a little bit more of what it looks like. Let's talk about a little bit off to the left here. The fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that this polynomial of degree five has five total roots. And again, roots are either real or imaginary. Um, again, all five could be real. Three of them could be real and two imaginary or one of them's real and four are imaginary. I put question marks here because we want to see what the case is. Well, we can clearly see that we have a couple real roots. So it's, it's you know, it's not the, four of them aren't imaginary. Um, but let's see where those roots are, these real roots are. Real roots, again, are where we hit the x-axis, they're x-intercepts. So if we look over here, we have a negative real root 
um, kind of close to maybe like negative half. Then that's, so that's this one negative real root. Then how many positive real roots do we have? It looks like we're only hitting the x-axis once over here on the positive side. Yes, that's true. However, what is the multiplicity of this positive root? This positive root has a multiplicity of two because it hits the x-axis and bounces back. Therefore, we do have two positive real roots. So we have one negative real root over here. It has a multiplicity of one. It occurs only once. And then we have two positive real roots here because this root occurs twice, has a multiplicity two. So what happened was we ended up having two positive reals and one negative real, just like Descartes' rule of sign says. Therefore, we ended up having a total of three real roots. So two of them are actually imaginary to add up to the total five for this quintic polynomial. I know that's a lot of vocab. That's a lot of understanding multiplicity, understanding real versus imaginary, fundamental theorem of algebra, degrees, all that stuff. But I'm hoping that it is all coming together. If there's something that you don't understand, a lot of these videos are really broken down by exact topics. So if you're confused about the fundamental theorem of algebra, check out that six minute video again. All right, guys, I hope that made sense for you and I will see you soon.